All right, I think we can go ahead and start. So I will go ahead and introduce our presenters. So hi, everyone. My name is Maddie Haley, and I want to welcome you all to the webinar series for the Autism Intervention Research Network on Physical Health, the AIRP. Thank you all for joining us today. Because of the number of participants, your audio will be muted throughout the call. However, you can submit questions at any point during the presentation via the chat box on your webinar console. This entire webinar is being recorded and will be available on the AARP website, aarpnetwork.ucla.edu. There will also be a short evaluation survey at the close of the webinar. We invite you to provide feedback on this webinar and also to provide suggestions for future webinars. In the interest of time, let's get started. We first want to acknowledge the Health Resources and Services Administration as the funding source for the AARP. Now it is my honor to introduce our speakers for today, Dr. Stephen Shore and Teal Benavides. Dr. Shore is a clinical assistant professor at Adelphi University, and Dr. Benavides is an associate professor at Augusta University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shore and Benavides. Thank you very much for the uh, introduction. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking to you about uh, promoting uh, authentic engagement of autistic individuals and in doing so, setting priorities to improve health outcomes. So first we want to acknowledge on uh, the next slide, uh, the, now you see who we are, on the next slide, uh, uh, PCORI, Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, who funded our project in meaningfully engaging autistic stakeholders in identifying these priorities. Now, uh, you can see the conflict of interest. Uh, and we have no conflict of interest. And the views presented here are solely the responsibility of uh, Teal and I. So moving on to the next slide. Now, uh, what we're going to focus on is uh, being able to answer the questions, uh, what preferences for engagement? What are the preferences for engagement of autistic individuals and what methods are successful in promoting the greatest amount of uh, engagement possible? And this uh, specifically as researchers. And then what are the health priorities that were identified by autistic adults? So on the next slide, the questions. Uh, why bother to engage autistic people in the first place in research? And then how do you go about doing so? So if we take a look at the why on the next slide, uh, we need to ensure that autistic people are involved in research. If we're going to be studying autistic people, uh, what could be more validating than direct involvement of autistic people uh, to the extent of our ability and the extent of our interests. And I'm purposely using what is known as condition first language or identity first language because most autistic adults identify with being aut autistic. We don't see it as being bad. We don't see it as shameful. It just kind of is. Uh, maybe like nationality or religious affiliation. I've Never heard of people with Americanism, for example, or with Christianity. It's just something that we are. We're autistic. Uh, it affects uh, major aspects and sometimes every aspect of our lives. Uh, we so often have uh, multiple and chronic and potentially preventable healthcare needs. Uh, uh, co-occurring conditions, sometimes referred to as comorbid, kind of an ugly word, so I prefer to use the word co-occurring, um, or if my pronunciation is really on its game, I might say concomitant uh, as well. So a lot of research is done, but not much is done in terms of involving autistic people in setting these priorities. So that's what this research uh, is all about. Now, what is interesting to note is that there are 
continuing to be increases in autistic involvement in research. Uh, we're seeing that in the IAC, for example, more autistic people being uh, nominated to the IAC as uh, the government strives to promote interagency collaboration uh, between organizations. Uh, as we flip over to the next page, uh, uh, the backbone of uh, authentic autistic, autistic engagement is authentic participation. So we engage in action research design that was participatory. Uh, the first thing we did is we established a project team of autistic, uh, diagnosed autistic individuals and non-autistic individuals. And we like to look at it that way as opposed to autistic and uh, neurotypical uh, because uh, someone may not be on the autism spectrum, but they may not necessarily be uh, autistic either. So perhaps non-autistic and we hear and autistic. Uh, when Teal and I first met after a, I did a presentation on uh, strengths, on autistic strengths at an INSAR conference, uh, we thought that, well, we could probably do research and write a publishable paper, but wouldn't it be so much better and so much more authentic to directly engage autistic individuals? Uh, so in doing so, we developed a paid community council of autistic adults, 18 uh, to be specific, most uh, on the autism spectrum. We also needed the collaboration of various other organizations who are stakeholders in promoting health for autistic individuals, other stakeholders such as Asperger Autism Network, GRASP, Autism Society of America, Autism Speaks, uh, the Drexel Autism Institute, uh, Aspire, uh, et cetera. And in that way, we can have the greatest diversity of uh, people uh, with differences, people on the autism spectrum. So what are some of the things that we did? What could we do to enhance engagement? And that was uh, the engagement arm of the uh, PCORI, the two-year PCORI award that we received. One is to, one was to engage in scientific research and the other part was the engagement piece. And in doing so, we developed and published an engagement guide as you see here. And as I think about engagement and compensation for autistic researchers, uh, four C's come to mind. The four C's of competence, communication, compensation, and consideration. So let's go a little bit more deeply into that as we go into the next slide. And one meme or phrase that comes to mind as I think about uh, authentic involvement and enhancing that, making that occur, is uh, what is good for the goose and is, is good for the gander. So what we are doing for people and with people and engaging people who are not on the autism spectrum, we should be doing the same thing for autistic individuals. And also that we can flip that around, whereas we devised ways uh, with input, with meaningful input from the community council made up of mostly autistic individuals, these strategies also end up being helpful for non-autistic people. So one thing we do is we assume competence. We assume that people who don't speak understand what is being discussed. And we see examples of that, say during uh, uh, team meetings or a teacher and parent meetings or clinician and parent meetings. And they'll be talking about the autistic individual who's just been evaluated or is being discussed as if they weren't in the room and commonly saying um, all kinds of deficit-based, making all kinds of deficit-based model comments, such as uh, 
this child won't be able to do this, can't do that, is unable to, and very little focus on the abilities or the strengths. And then much to uh, their surprise, the person who allegedly doesn't understand anything is suddenly engaging in some challenging behaviors because they may not be able to speak in the same way that I am talking to you uh, about how they feel and to provide suggestions, uh, they, do, they will communicate in a way that they know how. And sometimes that's a challenging behavior because that is the only thing that's left to communicate. We also need to adjust our language. Talking more about differences, as I think about autism uh, spectrum disorder, ASD, uh, that uh, the um, initials are very convenient. And we can, we can instead refer to autism spectrum differences. And it may be those differences that uh, provide gifts to some individuals who are able to process information and do tasks that other people just aren't able to do or find difficult to do. And at the same time, these differences can cause some very real, real disabilities, some very real challenges. And we must be cognizant of that, that there are significant challenges that often come with being autistic. And this is part of what this research is about. What can we do to address them and provide support? Being with the autistic person, not doing things to. So going beyond the awareness stage, which I think of as a sort of foundation for, okay, now we're aware that the person is autistic, be it in a, uh, a medical situation, be it at school, be it at home or in the community or in employment, and going the next step towards acceptance. And that's when we begin to work with the characteristics. We understand, that's when we have understanding of the strengths and the abilities that autistic people can bring to the society and work with them. So turning away from deficit-based language of disorder and disability to towards ability-based language. And the, again, the assumption that autistic people understand what is being said, even if they're not able to express that understanding in a way that we expect or that we're used to. So as we move on to the next slide, here's communication, enhancing engagement through communication. And here's an email, a format for an email developed by Alicia Askenazi that I think is helpful for everybody. And the, I know many autistic people, or non-autistic people who have reported to me that when using this format, now things become very clear because often when autistic people do not respond, it's because we're overwhelmed with details. And before we implemented this protocol and we were emailing in perhaps a more standard uh, flowery language, too much language type of manner, we got very little response, very few responses. We had a very low response rate when we made requests to the community council. And then when Alicia enlightened us to this protocol and we're using it as you see here, where we're minimizing words, every word is important and being very clear about what this email is about and also clear about what needs to be done. And sometimes no action is needed, but it's an update and we should be very clear about that or there are certain specific steps that need to be done. When we did this, our response rate went zoomed up to 90 to 100%. So very helpful. And uh, we're eager to share this strategy with other autistic people and with the world in general. So as we move up to slide 13, Another, another C of enhancing engagement is compensation, equal pay for equal work. So if an autistic person is engaged in research in some manner that a non-autistic person would be in, compensated for, 
so should the autistic person. And also realizing the importance of compensation uh, on a very pragmatic level, uh, there's a combined under and unemployment rate of autistic people that is 88%, at least according to the National Autistic Society in the United Kingdom. So what that means is that only 12% of us on the autism spectrum are in this uh, regrettably rarefied position of being employed to our capacity. So this vast under and unemployment uh, means much reduced uh, financial resources. So we take for granted that if we need to go to a meeting in the city, we take the train, which costs $12, and we make our way there, no big deal. But th that $12 may be very significant for an autistic individual who, again, may be part of the majority of us who are under and unemployed. So we set a rate of $50 an hour for community member, council member time in their advisory roles. And in some recent applications, uh, we've been able to bring that compensation to $100 an hour. So equal pay for equal work. It's a meme that we've heard in other communities. We can bring that here as well. Now, one thing that we need to be aware of is the potential barrier where payment may interfere with disability benefits. So that's, some, that's an area of future work. What can we do to make sure that the autistic person isn't penalized for maybe having over $2,000 in a bank account or exceeding some limit that a social uh, support agency has uh, created? So that's something that needs to be addressed, something that we need to look at. Uh, people cannot afford to lose uh, support benefits because they engage in research. So on the next slide, considerations. So how do we, how do we measure compensation? No, not compensation, how do we measure engagement? How do we know that at what level somebody is engaging them? And that's a difficult thing to do. That's very challenging. However, we have come up with some areas that we can begin to look at. And if we see positive action in these areas, uh, then we're moving towards positive engagement and promoting full and authentic engagement. So one area is trust. Do people feel free and safe to bring up differing ideas, contrasting ideas without getting shot down or called names. So in other words, can concerns be raised? And also are they meaningfully heard? And is something done to address those concerns? So uh, here's an example. Initially, we plan to capture priorities and discussions through Facebook. Now at that time, there were a lot of questions about, the, uh, about confidentiality of communications that occurred on Facebook. And many community council members were concerned. They raised these concerns and we addressed these concerns that led to changes in our methods. So uh, that's an example of number one, trust, not getting shot down and hearing words such as, no, everything's fine, don't worry about it. Well, if somebody's worried about it, there's a reason, and that concern uh, should be addressed and meaningfully heard. Uh, respect, that leads to respect. Equal value of contributions that I made, equality of voices in meetings and in making decisions, uh, not getting caught up with how many letters, what kind of alphabet soup, maybe at the end of a person's name. And that experience, personal experiences of being autistic are valued. And these contributions we see meaningfully included uh, throughout our work 
and also recognized, making sure that we recognize the contributions of everybody, autistic or otherwise. And that's why I'm making about a big deal about uh, mentioning Alicia Ashkenazi's name several times because she made some significant contributions and we want to make sure that uh, there's good awareness about that, on that. And uh, relatedly, making sure that community council members are offered the opportunity, multiple opportunities to author and co-author products and in being supported in doing so. So perhaps the standard academic process of collaborating when engaging in research and writing up the results, maybe we need to make some modifications to that. And indeed we did and we continue to do so that the opportunity is, continues to be provided. So multiple options for remaining engaged. Some of us are talkies and talk just the way I'm talking to you. Others communicate through assistive communication devices. Some people need additional time to process and to communicate. And we need to make sure that supports are provided in all of these areas. So moving on to slide 15. Here are some recommendations that we have for um, enhancing engagement, making sure that we have full and meaningful inclusion of autistics in all aspects of research from the initial discussions um, all the way to dissemination. Ensure that proper accommodations are made for participation and whether that's the accommodation of time or it might be the accommodation of style or the process that that participation takes place, we need to be continually and consulting the community council of autistic people. How can we make sure that this happens? Focusing on abilities and presuming competence, assuming that, as I mentioned before, that the autistic person understands what is being said. And we already know that receptive language tends to be better than expressive. So that means we need to focus on the abilities of that individual to express what needs to be expressed, however that that's done. Valuing autistics as an integral part of the team. So avoiding tokenism, getting way beyond tossing an autistic person onto a, an advisory board, for example, and pretending they're being listened to, but having that autistic person actively engaged in every aspect of research. Presenting research results in different modalities to accommodate different communication styles. So some of us are word-based, others are visually based. And part of that also includes the development of uh, presenting information uh, in layman's terms. So in other words, people who don't necessarily have fancy degrees and have perseverated on research such as Teal and I have so that we can process information presented in that way. And what about everybody else who uh, have not spent years engaging in research and reading that type of language? So we need to make sure that everybody who is reading and engaging in this material can do so. And we talked about compensation for time and experience, and that goes into valuing that time and experience. And then finally, as we always do, consulting autistics uh, regarding all aspects of research and systems change. So uh, as I close my portion of the presentation, uh, we also have some statistics on the next slide uh, describing how respondents wish to be engaged in research. And being a participant, that's way, way up there. And as you can see here, is that real desire for meaningful engagement in all aspects of research. And then I'll close with some related publications uh, that 
focus on uh, listening to the autistic voice. Because if we're studying, uh, um, topics that relate to autistic people, we need to be involving autistic people in all aspects of doing so. So at this point, I will turn you over to my partner in crime, Dr. Teal Penavides, to talk about priority setting for health research. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shore. Stephen, it's been um, such a pleasure to hear you share the various ways that we've engaged autistic people in our uh, autistic adults and other stakeholders engaged together project. It really was uh, such a collaborative way. And I do wanna just um, give a shout out to our community council members um, who are um, an integral part of our team um, and who are continuing to be involved today um, in continuing this work. So we're presenting on their behalf and on behalf of those who participated in this project. Some of you on the line may have uh, joined us in some of our, our approaches that we used. So I'm briefly gonna share about how we engaged the autism community in setting these priorities. Uh, we used a variety of approaches so that we could reach the maximum number of people possible um, across both the United States and beyond. Um, these iterative steps were developed, as Stephen mentioned, with the um, input and continual um, thoughtful uh, revision by our community council. So each decision point was made in consultation with them. We started off our priority setting approaches with a large group stakeholder meeting. And in this meeting, what we did is we brought together autistic adults, um, caregivers, researchers and other healthcare providers the day before a large autism meeting. And in this large stakeholder um, meeting, we had people break out into, into different topic areas. And we discussed what research had already occurred within um, autistic adult um, areas of focus. And we asked people to identify those areas that they felt were missing from the current research narrative. We used a variety of approaches that involved both spoken language as well as non-spoken language approaches using sticky notes to allow people to vote on different areas of a somewhat modified Delphi approach to allow people to share areas that they felt strongly about for future research topics and outcomes. Then we moved into working with our community council to create a way for the autism community community to be involved in setting those priorities, the broader community, not just those who attended our large stakeholder meeting in year one. And as Stephen mentioned, our original approach involved um, setting up a Facebook group and um, safe uh, private um, spaces in Facebook for people to share their thoughts. This approach had been IRB approved and um, was part of our original method submitted to PCORI. However, with the input from our community council, um, they were quite concerned, particularly with the Cambridge Analytica scandal happening at the same time about the privacy and confidentiality of using this approach. And so as Stephen mentioned, we, um, we immediately heard those concerns and said, okay, well, what, would, what should we do? What would you want to do? And our community council said, well, a survey is nice, but not everyone could participate in a survey. So we also need to engage people face to face to allow folks with um, augmentative and assistive communication devices or people who may not be on the internet to share their priorities. And so we engaged in um, using both an online survey on Qualtrics as well as face-to-face -face focus groups held in rural, suburban and urban locations in the state of New York. And we held small stakeholder uh, meetings with folks to identify both what they felt um, health research should focus on, the professionals that should be involved in that health, health research, the outcomes that were important to people, as well as what they envisioned uh, headlines to read. If, if there were headlines about health research, what those should be saying. And once we engaged in these online surveys in the face-to-face -face focus groups, both of which were submitted to our institutional review board, we then um, held a large uh, year two meeting um, supported um, it, by others and various organizations. And I wanna give a shout out to AUCD who 
allowed us to host this asset year two meeting the day prior to uh, the AUCD meeting in November 2018, um, prior to COVID. And so this at this year two meeting, we um, again shared what we had learned through our priority setting process. We shared quotes and direct information about the priorities and outcomes that people shared. And uh, people who attended this meeting um, again engaged in a modified Delphi approach of sharing what they felt were the top priorities using sticky notes and um, both interactive um, spoken and non-spoken approaches to allow people to share what should be uh, the top priorities. And so the, those priorities revolved around three areas. The first overwhelmingly was on mental health interventions and outcomes. The second was on how people um, access healthcare and those accommodations needed to receive healthcare. And the third area was on gender and sexual health and well being resources and supports as people are aging into adulthood. Our first uh, priority area on mental health was so important that we um, have published on this already. Uh, this was published last year in Autism called Listening to the Autistic Voice Mental Health Priorities to Guide Research and Practice in Autism from a Stakeholder Driven Project. Because this is an AIR key physical health webinar, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on our mental health priorities, but I encourage you to read it. It does provide some details on our methods. And I do wanna point out that many people linked their mental health needs with their physical health needs. And so as we move into those priorities related to access to healthcare and gender and sexual health and physical health and well-being. Please keep in mind that uh, um, among our mental health priorities, we had priorities related to addressing trauma, PTSD, well being, uh, social well being, and how to self manage one's own mental health and not have to see a doctor. What are ways that I can self manage my own health? And so a lot of these have importance for physical health and well being. And I encourage you to take a look. Um, also, since we don't have a lot of time to focus on these mental health priorities, I'll just briefly highlight, because it'll come up later, that among our outcomes that people felt were important to mental health, quality of life and sleep were among those top five um, mental health outcomes that people felt were important to measure. And we're going to see that those were also important when we take a look at physical health and well-being. So what about physical health? We asked a number of questions in different ways of both our survey uh, respondents and our focus group respondents. We use both open-ended and uh, forced choice types of responses to get at what outcomes matter to people and what does being healthy mean? We also inquired what health professionals should be involved in future research, as well as if people could wave a magic wand, what would they want to change about healthcare? as well as that last point that I brought up earlier, what's a breaking news headline about autism that you would want to hear? This last question about a breaking news headline was not specific to health, but tended to focus on topics um, that were actually health related. So when we think about physical health outcomes, people were asked to click and drag different outcomes into outcomes that matter to me, outcomes that don't matter to me, or I need more information to decide. And among those physical health outcomes that people um, clicked and dragged into outcomes that matter, sensory integration and processing, as well as quality of life, were endorsed by more than 70% of people who took our survey. And these two uh, physical health outcomes are interesting. Number one, because sensory integration and processing is something that is addressed in childhood, but less frequently is discussed uh, when we look, take a look at the health literature for adults. But people did bring up the importance of sensory processing, particularly in the environments of care that we'll um, identify as related to access to healthcare services. Quality of life and sleep are both consistent outcomes for both physical and mental health. And people also identified as, uh, uh, as important to them those interpersonal relationships and being able to socialize with other loved ones, as well as being able to engage in daily activities such as ADLs or other things in their community. When people's physical health was compromised, they mentioned not being able to participate 
in social activities or events or in those daily activities that they found reassuring, routine-based, and meaningful. We provided people not only a forced choice option to respond to outcomes that matter, but also gave an open-ended option to share what other things mattered to people. And although we received a number of responses, I wanna highlight a couple of those that are here on the screen. First, pain, chronic pain, migraine-specific pain, and headache-related pain were mentioned frequently by respondents. These were often mentioned in the same words or, or sentence as fatigue. So pain and fatigue were common outcomes that people wanted to address in future research. Also, people identified that gut and bowel health were important to them. They mentioned um, seeing uh, people for their gut and bowel health and not finding relief um, through diet and other sources of interventions and wondered what else could be done to address their gut and bowel health. This is certainly something that impacts physical health, but also was brought up as being related to someone's mental health in many of the comments that people submitted. Also, dyspraxia, loss of coordination, hypermobility of joints, and flexibility as people aged were identified as important outcomes. People mentioned not being able to move in the way they wanted, being clumsy, it being related to things such as falls or worry about falls or other outcomes. Although dyspraxia and mobility in childhood is frequently addressed, again, we don't frequently see this as an outcome that's addressed among adults and is something that people did bring up. People also brought up the idea of stress, cortisol and other stress-related hormones. Although these are strongly linked to mental health outcomes, we also want to point out that people brought these up in the same breath as um, immune conditions, other chronic conditions, and they wondered how these stress hormones were related to increased risk for chronic conditions such as diabetes, cancer, and other autoimmune conditions. People were wondering about how their mental health impacted their physical health and well-being and ways to improve their physical health and well-being through reducing these stress hormones. So one of the questions we asked people to consider both in the survey and in our focus groups using index cards or an AAC device to communicate what being healthy meant included some interesting quotes. These are representative of a variety of different quotes that people submitted to us. People felt that being healthy meant the absence of chronic illness. It also meant being able to access resources to help them manage their own health and well being. People wanted to be able to do things with little to no assistance. Again, being able to rely on one's own ability to manage their own health and well being. Being comfortable in one's abilities, having self esteem, being in tune, and understanding one's own body was an important outcome for being healthy. Others identified that being healthy meant not being sick or in pain being able to get enough sleep, being able to eat food that energizes you, and being able to contribute to the ability to regulate and self-regulate one's own mind and body. People also mentioned that being healthy meant having lower stress levels and being able to manage one's own stress. All of these things contributed to our future discussions about specific ways that people manage their health. So following these questions about what being healthy meant, we asked people how they managed their own health and well-being, and what are those things that helped them to do so, as well as ideas for, for future research that could help address these needs. One of the things that we asked was whether or not there were certain providers that should be involved in future research. And although a number of different providers were mentioned as being important to future research in autism, we learned that primary care providers, counselors and psychologists, and dental professionals were critical people who needed to be involved in the future research process. These were the individuals that people most frequently saw and felt were able to contribute to those priorities that were identified. So let's go over some of the access to care priority topics. I'm gonna to share first the priority topic areas that were um, set in our year two meeting, and then go back and identify specific quotes from individuals either in our survey or focus groups that exemplify what we meant when we um, prioritize that topic. 
The first access to care priority topic was trying to understand how systems navigators, people, or case managers, or others, other people, as well as technology, portals, apps, or other technology, could help autistic individuals navigate and achieve better health and well being. This is an interesting one, particularly since our priority setting activities happened before COVID, when telehealth was not a frequently used option, nor was it reimbursed at regular rates. So people wanted to know, how can somebody help me navigate the systems, these complex systems of care, Medicare, Medicaid, private insurance, the different types of providers that people needed to see. All were perceived as being very overwhelming, and particularly for those who needed to see a variety of providers, were felt to be too much for them to handle alone in some cases. Others mentioned barriers related to the environments in which they sought help or care, as well as how they actually were able to get to those providers. So people asked how non-emergency medical transit um, might be useful for helping people achieve access, particularly in those rural settings where there were no local providers that understood autism. This was particularly important because many people mentioned having a local provider, maybe a primary care provider that was within reach, but they didn't understand autism and maybe a provider that did understand autism lived in a city away or several hours away. And people really felt it was important to see somebody who understood their needs. So accessing that individual was difficult. Once people sought out an individual and were at a point of care for their own health, they found that communication with that provider was challenging. And this is not surprising. It has been published on very significantly and heavily by Christina Nicolaitis and Dora Raymaker and colleagues in their Aspire group. But communication came up time and time again. People found it difficult to communicate and difficult to understand what they needed to do in order to be healthy. And therefore this continues to be a top priority. How can we improve communication between patient and provider? And last but not least, many people felt that the environments of care were not friendly places to be. The sensory environment was overwhelming. The, um, the, the other people in the environment, the repeated requests for the same information, you have to fill out the same types of forms every time. These types of environmental challenges were felt to be a barrier by many people. And so we posed how could we um, Im implement sensory friendly, optimal healing environments on how people access and receive care. So when people told us what they would change about healthcare, they talked about communication. They said, making it definitely easier to tell your doctor what's going on, primarily because it's so anxiety ridden when you go to the doctor. Another person mentioned that in a, in a, a point of care experience, they said, I'll get focused on one thing that's been told to me and they've moved on and now, whoa, we're three steps down the way. I would like a written summary at some point, word for word. Provider understanding and presumption of competence came up not only in our research um, engagement, but also an engagement, engagement from providers in the healthcare setting. People said, I would wave a magic wand to stop doctors from treating me as a subhuman or a little child as soon as they learn I'm on the spectrum. Another said, I would love if doctors and clinicians understood aspects of autism. So helping train providers in autism and how to communicate effectively would be important next steps to improve access to care. When people talked about the environments of care, we wanted to share what one person said about the waiting room. One person said changing the way waiting rooms work because waiting in a waiting room with loud noises, smells, like people wearing perfumes, lights, it's so taxing. This individual went on to say, when I go to a restaurant and I'm waiting for a seat, Somebody gives me a buzzer and I can go sit in my car and then I'm called in when the table is ready. Why can't we do that at a healthcare setting? So we have technology and solutions to improve the waiting experience or other aspects of the care environment, but we may not have translated them yet into healthcare settings. I believe that COVID has fundamentally changed the types of care that people receive. And I think that new technologies would be useful to investigate related to these access to care priorities. Similarly, People uh, talked about all of these access barriers together. One individual said, I have to do everything myself because everyone has their own things to do. And my parents work a lot and live two hours away. I do not get good care and cannot tell 
if it's because I'm just bad at communicating and I forget a lot, or they, the providers just don't care. I say things and they don't listen. And sometimes it feels like I'm a child with no say in the care I get. I stopped going to the doctor because I did not get the care I needed and it was too expensive. So in the single quote, we heard aspects of transportation, communication, provider presumption of competence, as well as costs and financial barriers. All of these things that people shared with us are important to consider as we think about access to care. Our last area of priority was on gender and sexual health. Specifically, there were three topic areas that people wanted to focus on in future research and practice. First was how can we improve autism diagnosis in females and non-binary individuals on the spectrum? We had a number of individuals, about 21% of our survey sample identified as non-binary. And individuals reported that the diagnostic process was complicated, mainly because the signs and symptoms in standard assessments tend to focus on those identified primarily in males, or those assessments have been validated primarily in male samples. Understanding how autism diagnosis is expressed in females and non-binary individuals was felt to be a priority. Second, individuals wanted to know and explicitly ask how hormonal changes across the lifespan impacted their health and well-being. So how did it affect their skills, such as memory and executive functioning? Or how did it affect their abilities to be a parent or to have children? Or how did the sensory systems change and how did that impact their work or other abilities in, in their daily lives? Last but not least, people talked about experiencing trauma and sexual assault quite frequently. And this was our top priority for mental health and well being. However, it also shows up here in gender and sexual health because people noted that there were very few resources for supporting autistic individuals in learning about and understanding their own bodies and sexual health needs. When people are denied access to information and resources that guide them in something that's a normal adult function, then problems are likely to occur. And people mentioned not having access to the same sexual health development information as a child or adolescent, and they did not understand when sexual assault happened to them, they were, they were expressing fear and also um, lack of understanding of what needed to happen in those situations. This is an urgent priority because sexual assault is much more common among autistic individuals and individuals with intellectual disability. And so we want to make sure that people understand that this is happening and we need to address it. I'm running short on time. And so I'd like to, um, allow people access to the, these slides at a later time and um, end with our uh, limitations and discussion questions. So we have enough time for questions. So we did have a convenient sample of people who responded to both the survey and the focus groups and who attended our year one and year two meeting. These priorities should be confirmed by others. We also relied on people who did say that they self-identified as autistic. Not only did we have people with a diagnosis, a confirmed diagnosis, but we did allow people to indicate if they had self-identified without a formal diagnosis. We think that future priority setting work needs to occur with individuals who would have had limited uh, ability to consent um, or participate in these activities. So people under guardianship were not participating in these um, activities. We did have um, some racial and ethnic diversity in our sample, but not sufficient. More work needs to be done in different communities. And while I mentioned that we had approximately 21 to 22% of our survey sample were non-identified as non-binary, more work needs to be done here, particularly since one of the priority areas was on gender and sexual health and well-being. So further understanding of the specific needs of this community are warranted. So I'd like to invite Stephen to um, uh, share his screen and his face again so that we can discuss with you any questions, concerns, or thoughts you have about this work. Thanks so much for being here today.
Thank you so much, Dr. Shore and Benavides, for your presentation and also for your work in this area. Um, as they mentioned, as Dr. Benavides mentioned, we do have some time for questions and answers from the audience. Um, it doesn't look like anyone has typed anything in the chat yet, but please feel free to um, go ahead and ask any questions, and we'll be um, they'll be available to answer. If there aren't any questions, um, I invite people to contact um, both Stephen or myself through email. And uh, we look forward to answering any questions and continuing this work in collaboration with others. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, I'll second that. Often, Go ahead, Stephen. No, often, often questions come later on as people have a chance to uh, process. Thank you again to the AIRP and AUCD for hosting us today. Um, Teal, was the registration information, um, were those other AIRP slides at the end of the presentation as well? Yep. Okay, perfect. Yes, so please feel free to contact us at this email address. And then there's also a feedback survey. I can uh, provide the link in the chat as well very quick. Um, let me just provide that. And then um, if you go to the next slide, um, here's the QR code to sign up for our newsletter. And the next slide. So this is the uh, next month's August webinar. It's going to be with Dr. Jennifer Ames, who worked closely on the um, gender, sexuality, and reproductive health node at, for the AIRP network. And I will also put the link in the chat for registering for that event as well. Thank you so much for having us. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.